Welcome everyone to a One Struggle presentation. One Struggle is an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist organization with chapters in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, New York, Sudbury, Canada, Grinnell, Iowa, and sort of in Connecticut. Um, if anybody's interested in working with us, uh, we're always open to that and love to work with people on various projects. Um, so please keep in contact, talk to us after, whatever. Um, so I'm thinking maybe we should go around and have everybody introduce each other or themselves and for those who don't know each other. Um, and then Mark Lizetti of One Struggle and Kasama will speak about what corporatism is um, or isn't, and what capitalism is or isn't. And um, his views are his own and don't necessarily represent one struggle or anyone else in one struggle. Um, all right, so do you want to start? All right. <coughs> so welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, try and make this work through time. <laughs> so we started doing these presentations about a year ago, give or take. Um, and so, and we started off with uh, Stephanie's presentation, um, Capitalism Must Die, and the book's back there. And so if uh, we start with Capitalism Must Die, if we had a presentation, Capitalism Must Die, this one could be, t could be titled Capitalism and the State Must Die. Um, but it's, it's corporatism is capitalism. And uh, so we've gone from Capitalism 101 to now we're doing Capitalism 102. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the other organization that I'm with, Kasama. Kasama is a communist network. Um, you know, we're uh, kind of a, re a regathering of communists trying to look at you know, what happened in the 20th century. How did it, you know, how, how did it go wrong? Uh, what can we do to build a movement in this century? Um, my views do not necessarily represent those in, in Kusama, uh, but they don't necessarily not. I mean, people, individuals in both One Struggle and Kusama may share my views and may not. Um, I myself have been a communist for about 25 years now um, in different struggles. Uh, you know, started out in, against the first Gulf War against Iran, or Iraq, and uh, looks like there's going to be a third one now. So, the more things change, more they stay the same. <clears throat> uh, so, what, you know, why are we, why are we having this discussion? I kind of joked about it a little bit, you know, you see these memes on Facebook, it's like, look, you know, I'm not against capitalism, I'm against corporate greed, or look, the problem isn't capitalism, the problem is crony capitalism, and all these kind of things, they kind of fail to understand you know, what the problem is, what capitalism is, how it actually functions. Um, now, all of us can kind of, you know, in some way intuit, grasp, I mean, almost everybody agrees that corporations are a big problem today. Um, these things that we've created, they're kind of like a Frankenstein's monster. Um, you know, we made them and now they run our lives. Uh, they run our governments, they run, you know, they are poisoning the planet. And so people's solutions to them kind of vary widely. So in the progressive movement or liberals, they think, well, if we just put a leash on them, you know, that'll help. And so you see, you know, I don't want to, I'm not going to beat up on anybody in particular, but there's a movement now to uh, get a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, as if, you know, taking away their power to give money to uh, the government would bring things, bring them back under control. Um, or others think, well, we just need more regulation. Um, libertarians, on the other hand, think that the problem is, is that the corporations are able to control the government, so therefore what we need to do is get rid of the government. As if, they, you know, not having the state at their beck and call, they wouldn't simply create their own, you know, functions like, oh, well, we need an army to go do this, well, we'll just hire a bunch of people, give them guns, and they'll go do that. You know, we need to repress our workers, and we don't have police to do that. We'll just hire a bunch of guys with, you know, baseball bats and guns, and they'll go do that. Um, so we, you know, jump from the frying pan into the fire. 
Um, and for my anarchist friends out there, and especially for people in other countries who gnash their teeth you know, we use the term libertarian in this way, because of course 150, 170 years ago, we were the libertarians. They stole that name from us, as they are trying to steal the t term anarchist today. As I've said elsewhere, any libertarian using the term anarchist gets a free curb stopping. <laughs> Conservatives and reactionaries, of course, love the way that things are. They, they agree that corporations are very powerful and they think that's great, you know, more of it. Um, with the exception of fascists who, interestingly enough, um, think that corporations are a problem, especially if they're controlled by Jews. And, you know, they have a rhetoric of trying to bring the corporations back under control. But once they actually take power, they do the exact opposite. They become every bit as much the hired thugs of the corporations as the state was before. <clears throat> and then there are people who cotton to conspiracy theories. So rather than looking at the capitalist system as a problem, rather than looking at the you know corporations themselves as a problem, they'll look at specific like, oh, there's this, you know, everything would work fine if it weren't for a few secret actors behind the scenes ruining it for everybody. You know, and that could be the Illuminati, that could be the Rothschilds, which is usually code for the Jews. Um, it's a way to get away with saying the Jews without actually saying the Jews. Um, but whenever anybody says the Rothschilds, I mean, that stuff came right out of the, the Birchers, it came out of the, fascist, the Nazis, you know, straight up anti-Semitism. Um, or they might talk about Monsanto, as if, Mons as if one particular corporation is the problem, or one particular family of capitalists, the Kochs. You know, or the fact that they get together and have conferences is proof of some kind of secret conspiracy, like when they get together at the Bilderbergers um, Hotel or Davros Convention or the Bohemian Grove. Um, in fact, that's just kind of the normal functioning of capitals. I mean, we have, you know, you look around and you see, uh, what are they, uh, Chamber of Commerce committees in every city. You know, the capitalists get together and they figure out how can we make the system work better for us? You know, that's just normal. You know, people organize to try and get what they want. Um, so before I go into the full presentation, we should probably uh, discuss a few terms. You know, like capitalist, capitalism, you know, because that's a big contention. You know, one of the things that libertarians often say is, well, true capitalism has never been tried. You know, as it, and, and, they'll, and they will keep telling you, well, no, this is what capitalism really is, as if they were the ones who kind of defined what the term was. But the word capitalist uh, actually started in the 17th century, and it just, when they started using it, it just referred to somebody who had a business, it was like, you know, somebody who was applying their capital. The first use of the word, and capitalism kind of originated at the time, and it meant uh, somebody who was doing that. You know, so capitalism was what a capitalist did. You know, didn't have any deeper meaning. There was no kind of like, um, well, you have to have these things, or you know, or it's a it's a system, you know it's a whole system. No, it's just you know what you did. So like, if you were a shoe shine, you know, if you like a, a, a shoe shiner shines shoes, well, capitalist does capitalism. That kind of thing. Didn't really have a deeper meaning. The first use of it to talk about the system, the way of life, as a, as an entire social network, um, a social order, was in the 1850s, and it was by the communists who we were the first people to say, this is what capitalism is. So we define the word, we get to say what it is and what it isn't. Argument over. <laughs> <laughs> we also need to talk about what corporatism is. And corporatism is used two different ways. There is an actual term in political science called corporatism, it goes back to Plato, and what that term means is uh, there's a Latin root, corpor corpus, which means body. And so they're talking about the bodies of society. And so getting all the different bodies of society together, working together, that was corporatism. Um, and that's what it means when, when uh, Giovanni Gentile, who was a theorist of fascism, said that Fascism is the unity of corporations and the government. Um, he meant that older version, he meant that older uh, definition of corporation and corporatism. And there are various different governments called corporatist or corporatism. Um, for example, the, uh, the Peronist government 
of Juan Perón was considered was a type of corporatism. But when people, when you generally hear that term today, corporatism, people are talking about the corporations being in bed with the government. And so that's the term that, you know, that's the type that we're going to talk about today, that kind of corporatism. We also want to talk about what is a free market and what is a monopoly market, because these are terms that libertarians like to throw around. And a free market is any market in which there is no actor powerful enough to dictate what the market's doing. So you could have, you know, so it doesn't matter how many are in there, as long as no single actor in the market is powerful enough to, to influence it. So that it's a random, chaotic uh, bunch of interactions. And so a, a monopoly market is a market in which that's no longer true, in which one or more actors are now powerful enough to influence how the market turns out. So let's have a brief history of capitalism, if we can. Brief, what is that? How, how brief is that going to be? Brief according to me. Now, like, I think when I do these things, I'm going to do a 15-minute discussion. It's already been 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I mentioned earlier about how uh, the libertarians say that you know, there's never been true capitalism. Capitalism's never really been tried. This isn't really capitalism. And what they're doing when they say that they're engaging in a no true Scotsman fallacy, it's a type of logical fallacy, which basically goes, the, the explanation is like this, and that's how it's got its name. Uh, you know, somebody says, well, you know, no Scotsman would ever put sugar on his oatmeal. And somebody replies to him, well, I just saw, you know, Pagarni down at the, the pub, and he was putting, you know, sugar on his oatmeal. And the person replies, no, no true Scotsman. So what they're doing is they're changing the definition. They're, they're upping the definition in order to say, well, this reality doesn't really exist. So they're saying, this isn't really capitalism. That way, they don't have to deal with the problems that capitalism really has. And that actually happens with socialists, too. So you get a lot of true socialism has never been tried. Well, that logical fallacy applies to us, too. Um, so. But that's not the point of today's talk. <laughs> <laughs> Capitalism's origins go back a long, long, long way. Um, you know, uh, back before the Roman Empire, back before Greece, at a point when you know you could have somebody who had enough capital, enough money to be able to hire other people, use their work to to make things to sell. But that's not how the entire system existed. Uh, and back in those days, it was based, the major system it was mostly based on slavery. Uh, so somebody would own a whole bunch of people, they'd own a whole bunch of land, they'd put people to work on that land, and that's how most of the goods and services for a society were produced. That was replaced in Western Europe, or in, in Western Europe in the Near East, with a system called feudalism, because slavery got inexpensive, because people really didn't want to be slaves. Uh, so instead what they do is they would tie people to the land. You're free, you don't, nobody owns you, but you're stuck to this piece of land and you can't leave, and you owe somebody else your labor. Well, not everything could be produced that way. And so even in this period, there were still people who would hire people for money, who would take the things that they made and sell them for more than they had paid for. Uh, and this is pretty much how the world worked for several thousand years. Um, slowly growing throughout the world. And then in the mid 14th century, uh, a major human disaster happened, and that was the Black Death. And it swept the old world uh, from China, from Mongolia to China, through India, the Middle East, Africa, and in Europe. Um, and in Europe, it hit really hard. Uh, and there are estimates of as much as two thirds of the population disappeared. And this had a massive effect on the social structure because these lords and ladies who had previously been able to just say, well, you have an obligation to work for me because I am the lord and this is how our system works. Suddenly, all the stuff that they were used to getting, all the work they were used to having, there weren't enough people to do it all. And so those people were able to start commanding 
a price for their labor. They were able to say, say no, I'm not going to do that for you because you've got nobody else. I mean, you're going to have to pay me this. And they tried passing laws to stop it, but you, you know, you can't pass law. I mean, you can try and pass laws against reality. Uh, you know, North Carolina is trying to pass a law against global warming, but, <laughs> but we'll see who wins that argument. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, starting in the, in the late 14th century, you start to have a change in the system. People start being able to, to, uh, you know, to, you know, get more money for their work, and since they have more money, they start to want to buy things. At the same time as this is going on, uh, in the Middle East, there's a group of people called the Turks who are taking over, um, and it's partly because of the plague as well, because it hit the Arabs really hard. Uh, the Turks were nomadic people, so they just swept in, um, took control, and they took control so fast and so rapidly and started moving into Europe that the Europeans got scared. Uh, up until that point, all of their spices had come through the Arab ports and through trade with the Arabs. Um, and this was important to, to Europe because uh, at that time, European food was awful. European food, I mean, a lot of European food, even today, is based on, on the, the proportion of rottedness it is. I mean, think about it. What's cheese? Cheese is rotted milk. Beer is rotted you know, barley and water. Hey. <laughs> hey, it's, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> but, hey, like yogurt, rotted milk, uh, rotted fish, rotted, you know, they would leave their meat up to hang, and so this food, you know, very often was absolutely god-awful. Um, and the only way you could eat it was with spices if you were rich. Because you know they're such delicate little flowers. Uh, other people just eat oatmeal and whatnot, uh, but not with sugar, <laughs> because they didn't have sugar. Uh, so the uh, the Western European powers were really kind of unhappy about giving all of this money to the people who were trying to conquer them, and so they began for looking for other ways to get their hands on these spices. The Portuguese began rounding Africa. The Spanish headed west across the ocean, thinking the world was much smaller than it was. Ran into uh, a couple of continents with about 100 million people in them, and discovered it. Uh, conquered it very rapidly, thanks to uh, disease um, that people here couldn't uh, handle. Took over old empires filled with gold and silver, and promptly started bringing all of that money back to Europe. And so Europe was suddenly flooded with money and nothing to buy, which set the prices of things up really high. And since so the prices of things were up really high, people were like, well, how can I get my hands on some of this money? And so capitalism has its origins as a system, has its origins in these two twin disasters, not enough people and way too much money. Um, and a system begins, which today they call monetarism, but uh, in the capitalists began for, in, in, Europe, in England, for example, they began kicking the people off the common land so that they could put sheep on those lands, grow the sheep, shear the sheep, and then they would hire people, the people whose lands who had been kicked off the land, who no longer had a source of income, who had no longer had a way to, to pay for their own, you know, to, to make a living, they would hire those people back to, to, to make the wool into shirts, and then they would sell the shirts to the people who were stealing all this gold. And that is how capitalism began to become a big system. And over time, uh, the rules of the old system began to come into conflict with this new way of making money. For example, there were laws about you know, a bolt of linen could only be a certain length. And you could no longer, it could only be dyed a certain way. Um, there were all kinds of restrictions on trade. There were all kinds of restrictions on the way things were made. And starting in the 18th century and the 19th century, there began to be uh, revolts against the system. And the capitalists themselves began to overthrow the old order, sometimes in combination with the workers. They would say to the workers, well, we're all going to be free now. We're all going to be equal in this new society. Um, and equality based on, on money. You know, one dollar is equal to one dollar, and I've got more dollars. So, uh, At this time, when all of this is going on, a uh, Scottish economist with the name of Adam Smith writes his book, you know, The Wealth of Nations. Um, he does not use the term capitalism. 
He does not say, here is a new way to run the world. This is a new way of doing things. He says, this is what's going on around us. Here's how we can do it better. We can make it work better. But he also, and he also says a lot of things that a lot of people tend to forget. For example, he said that, he used the term industrialist instead of capitalist. He said, when industrialists get together as a group, it's always against the public interest. And he said that in any conflict, in any disagreement between the worker and the industrialist, because the industrialist has the, you know, the, the disproportionate amount of power, he will always win. You know, this, isn't, this is the, the guy who's held up as a hero by libertarians, and he sounds kind of radical for his day and age. Um, you know, combinations of capitalists are bad for us, and workers get the, shot, you know, the short end of the stick when it comes to dealing with the capitalists. Hardly this uh, system of free contracting, that like, we come together as equals and contract freely. Uh, Adam Smith actually says the exact opposite. Um, as a result of these various revolutions, a lot of the restrictions on trade were blown away. Um, and so we have a period roughly from the beginnings of the American Revolution or the War of Independence, actually, because it wasn't really revolution. The capitalists started, you know, the capitalists ran things before in, the, in America. They ran things afterwards, so it wasn't a revolution. No new class came to power. They just won their independence from Great Britain. So, uh, but there was a period of about roughly then to the 1850s or so when markets were were free. You know, uh, you had lots of small capitalists, factories making things, uh, and then as uh, technology increases, as uh, they begin to create new technologies, new methodologies, um, they begin to uh, need more and more capital in order to make their machines. And so you have, uh, you, know, you have new methods of making steel. And so you can suddenly have you know, railroads stretching across continents. And that takes a lot of money. It also makes people fabulously wealthy. But in order to get all that money, you have to be able to combine lots of small capitalists into one giant capitalist. And so this is when the corporation really begins to take off. It's a way of, of creating the giant sums of wealth that you need in order to, cre to do, you know, build skyscrapers and build iron bridges and build you know, steel ships. Um, and all of the, the amazing technology that began to take off in, in the late 19th century. This also gives the Western European powers the ability to conquer the planet. Um, so the late 19th century is the period of imperialism. Um, as they begin to get more and more wealth, uh, they begin to have less and less place to invest it in their own countries. They've overdeveloped it, so they begin to look for other places to develop, you know, to invest their money to make to make more money. It's always about making more money. Um, but you don't want to put your money someplace where you d you know you don't have control over it. So if you put your money in another country, and suddenly the country's like, well, now we're not going to pay you back. So what they do is they just start sending their <coughs> military. <Lessons. laughs> They start sending their militaries around the globe to secure their investments, to secure the resources they want. Um, and this, of course, makes them even more wealthy. Um, by this point, they're becoming monopolies. Uh, they control the market. You know, nobody can really stop them. And in response to this, uh, we start to see the progressive era. Uh, people saying, oh, the corporations are out of control. We need to put, you know, we need to restrain them. We need to break up the trusts and the cartels. And so you have people like, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a staunch capitalist, you know, make his reputation on breaking up the huge corporations, the huge cartels, um, which were combinations of capital of combinations of corporations. Uh, this period led to the First World War, which was up to that point you know, the most devastating that they had re could remember. In response. Uh, one of the countries that was part of that war, they overthrew their capitalists, they set up their own socialist system, scared the crap out of the other capitalists. Uh, and there's this guy, John Maynard Keynes, and he says, one of the things he says, and this is a, this is a meme that's going around on Facebook frequently now, is, is that capitalism is the belief that the nastiest of men can do the nastiest of things for the public good. Um, but what he says is that Unrestrained capitalism is causing everybody problems. 
um, not just the, you know, not just poor people, because he didn't really care about that, but that they would get crazy, they'd get carried away, and then the economy would take off, and then it would crash. And he says, what we need to do is we need to restrain it during its period of runaway, um, start, ta you know, start taxing it so we can bring in the surplus into the government, and in periods when the government crashes, or when the economy crashes, we can start spending lots of money to keep the, the crash from being as bad as it was. And that's kind of how Western capitalism worked for a good 70 years or so. Um, one of the ways that they would redistribute wealth, especially spending it during these periods, was welfare, um, social security, uh, all kinds of you know job building programs. Um, and this got a rep because the social democratic parties of Europe, you know, latched on to this idea of um, they would take all this surplus from the capitalists and spend it on the on the poor. Um, this system uh, got the term socialism, although it had never been considered socialism before. Uh, and so, when you talk to a lot of people today, that's you know this welfare capitalism, this uh, restrained, leashed corporation capitalism is what they think of as socialism. But towards the end of the 60s, into the early 1970s, this wasn't working anymore. This, this um, restraining the capitalists and giving stuff to the workers, the, the rate of profit was beginning to decline. Uh, profit was going down and inflation was going up and it's a period called stagflation. In response to stagflation, they began to deregulate. They, they began to deregulate industries, they began to cut, you know, to, to smash unions. Um, we entered a period roughly from the late 70s on till today, what we can call the period of austerity, where the order of the day is, you know, they'll, they'll, um, they'll regulate the system by Price control, not price controls, uh, interest rates. So the government will loan money at certain rates, but they won't actually you know, redistribute it. They get rid of the regulations. So one of the things that it was argued caused the recent crash, the Great Recession, was the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Um, so that was a regulation that had been that banks have been chafing under for about 70 years. Um, and all around the world, you see these regulations coming off of the corporations. Um, at the same time, they're smashing unions. Wages are going down. Uh, what you know, um, the price of universities is going up faster than uh, um, grants and, and student loans. In fact, they and they started moving from giving people grants to go to school to switching to a loan system, where so now you have to borrow to go. Um, as wages are beginning to fall. The corporations are creating, are getting even more and more wealth. And they're like, well, what can we do with this? Well, why don't we loan it back to the people that we, we took it from? And so, in, in addition to this austerity, we see a massive rise in consumer debt. Um, and that's kind of where we're at today. So, a lot of people say that this system, either they either say this is this is the best system we could have because human beings are actually greedy. Are, are massively greedy creatures, and so this is this system works for greed, and so it's the best system we could possibly have. Or you're on the flip side, you have liberals who say that, well, the problem is greed. It would be a good system if it just worked for unrestrained greed. Um, and they both, both you know, libertarians and liberals, attribute this to human nature. Um, this is again the logical fallacy. It's the natural fallacy. It's, Assuming that simply because something is natural, that is therefore true or good. You know, what do we even mean by natural anyway? And the truth is, we don't really know what human nature is because human beings don't exist outside of human society. Human beings are shaped by you know, our society. Look, everybody in this room is wearing clothes. Is clothes natural? You know, do we think that clothes would be natural if we were living in a state of grace? Mm -hmm. right. Sorry, my old. Uh, <laughs> My old Christian teacher was popping out. Uh, <laughs> if we were all living in a state of nature, would we be wearing clothes? Like, no. But everybody wears them. So, so there's a kind of a, you, you know, you look around, you see everybody doing something, and you assume that's part of, the, you know, what human beings really are. 
And we live in a society in which greed is rewarded. We live in a society in which not only rewarded, but it's a survival mechanism. And so everybody acts greedy, and the people who do the best are the greediest. And we assume that, oh, human beings must be greedy. But it's pretty easy to debunk this. You just look around human, you know, you look around the world, you look at human history, there are societies in which if someone was, you know, had too much wealth, they were, you know, they were shunned. Uh, there is an American Indian nation, the Hopi, who if you showed up and you had too much money, you had too much wealth, they didn't think you were even human, they thought you were an evil spirit, and they would send you away, like, no, go away. Uh, the Catholic Church used to, and uh, I think Islam today, still bans collecting interest on money. Usury was a, was a sin in Catholicism, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, every country in Europe, Western Europe, tried to make sure that they had a certain amount of Jews because they wouldn't be affected by those laws, by the laws against Catholicism, and so they could have them take care of the interest, which conveniently made everybody hate them. Uh, and so we have you know, several thousand years of anti-Semitism because of, because of that little thing. Uh, you know, but you can look around, you can see, and for most of human history, this couldn't have been you know, possible. In fact, hoarding too much would have been a liability in, in certain societies because you're always on the move. And if you, you know, hoarding makes it impossible to be old, to be a nomad. I mean, three million, three, three and a half million years of human history, we're constantly on the move. You, know, you only stay in some place long enough in order to be able to, to eat what you could, and then you move on when the herds moved on, when the seasons changed. You know, if you were bogged down with, with belongings, you wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, so this is really something, this emotion, this way of being, only becomes possible at a certain stage of human history. So if greed's not the problem, could we imagine a capitalism without greed? When we do a thought experiment, what would happen if we took greed out of the equation? What would capitalism without greed look like? You know, say if the liberals had their way. Well, you'd still have people buying and selling. And you'd still have some people who were able to do to, to make and sell things more efficiently than others. And so they would be able to command a lower price. So you'd still have winners and losers in the market. Some people would be destroyed, others would do better. And so you'd still see um, you'd still see accumulation of wealth in the hands of some. You'd still see ruination because of, for others. You'd still see the rise of great fortunes simply because of diff, you know, natural variation. So you know, capitalists would still need to cut, you know, the capitalists who weren't as efficient would still need to cut costs. It's like, well, if I'm losing business to this guy across the street, you know, and I want to stay in business and I don't want to become a worker, well, I'm just going to have to, I'm going to have to cut my costs someplace else. So maybe I'll cut costs by forcing my workers to work for less, or making them work longer, but for the same amount of money. Or maybe I'll use more, uh, uh, or less costly materials in, in the process. Or maybe I'll do things that aren't safe. You know, anything, you know, so in this case, greed isn't necessarily a motivator, but fear of destruction is a motivator. And we can see that capitalism would look almost the same if you take greed out of the equation. Now, of course, greed does exist, and greed does make things worse. I and mean, one of those things, one of those reasons, those things that people have to worry about is, you know, well, my competitors are greedy. You know, they're going to do unscrupulous things, so I have to do them first. Uh, there's a book written by Upton Sinclair called Oil, which was made into a movie, There Will Be Blood. And the capitalist in this story, uh, oil owner, he tried to be a good guy, but his competitors undercut him and you know, they, they sabotaged him. And, and he was forced just by the nature of his competition to act like a bad guy. There was a real world capitalist a uh, socialist by the name of Robert Owen, who thought, you know, I can prove that we can make this system better, that we can help the workers and still make a profit. And he set up these utopian societies. Uh, one of them, the most famous of one, was called New Harmony, and it was in Indiana. And 
by all accounts, treated the workers very well, paid them well, gave them sick leave. Uh, this was in the 1840s, you know, before that kind of thing was even heard of. But the world market changed, and he was no longer able to do this for, you know, and still make a profit. He himself, personally, was unable to, you know, to, to do to his workers what needed to be done in order to save his building, to save his business. Um, he didn't have the, the emotional strength to be a bastard. And so instead, he shut down his entire business as if that would help his employees by making them all unemployed. Um, but this guy, and this was a guy who he would take his success and would go around all the capitals of Europe and say, see, it can be done. Um, and he only finally started to get it when a, a French minister took him aside and said, yes, we see it can be done. We don't want to. You know. So we can see what drives you know, capitalist behavior. Competition, fear of destruction, and actually greed. Greed's part of the equation, but it's not what makes it bad. And it can't be taken out. It can't be taken, if it could be taken out, it would still be a problem, but it can't be taken out. Um, because it is part of our nature. It's not the sole, it's not the sole, sum total of our nature. It's not our chief um, motivation, motivator. You know, human beings are very complex creatures. We have multiple motivations, uh, but it is there. Is a problem. So capitalism has a cycle, you know, as I was talking about in the when we were imagining it without greed. Capitalism has a cycle of accumulation. So as you know, as the capitalist is you know, selling, you know, having these, you know, these goods created and selling them, they're bringing in wealth. Part of that is being used um, in personal consumption. So you know, he's getting his his Ferrari, his nice mansion, his yacht. And, um, part of it is going into uh, reinvesting in the business. So, you know, keeping the tools and machines up to date, getting new computers, betting software, uh, paying for the workers themselves because they have to, you know, they have to live in order to be able to keep working. Although not every capitalist cares about that because there's, in many places in the world, there are more work, more available workers than there, than there are uh, jobs, and so. You know, you can pay your workers less than they need to survive, and you know they'll die off, and you just hire new people. It happens in a lot of places. Um, and as they're cre you know, as they're gathering in all this new wealth, all this new value, um, we have uh, you know some people are more successful than others. They're able to buy out their competitors, even though their competitor has money. They now have more control over the market. They can get even wealthier, even faster. And then there are periods when we have uh, economic crises. Um, we just went through one. We're probably about to go through another coming up soon. It's been, it's been six years already. It's been six years since the Great Recession. We're due. Uh, they happen every, you know, every five to ten years. Like you know. and In fact, we, on our way over here, we were just listening to uh, some stock people say, in, uh, stock analysis talking about uh, you know problems with uh, how the market is run right now. The stock market is run right now, and uh, as proof that computers weren't the cause of um, of uh, stock crashes, he talks. About, he's like, well, going back to 1896 when there was a business crash, we've had you know one every 10 years almost, but even before we were ever using computers, you know, even the capitalists recognize that we have them every you know every five to 10 years. This isn't just something we make up. Although there is a joke, you know, communists have predicted, uh, you know, ten of the last three recessions. Mm -hmm. So, when these crashes happen, some businesses, you know, fail. Some of them make it. Some of them, um, when they come out of it, they'll come out of it stronger. Uh, you know, because they have less competition. They may have bought. Their competitors for pennies on the dollar. So they come out, and so each time this happens, these businesses get bigger and bigger. Larger and larger fortunes are made. One of the things that happens is. Um, at the same time, is all this money is getting put into banks. And the banks aren't really, 
they then turn around and loan that money out again. Um, so they're on hock for the money they've loaned. And they're very risk aversive. So they want to start shaping things in a way to make their investments safer. So one of the things they do is in addition, you know, as even though you've got this one track over here where just naturally through the mechanism, normal mechanism of the market, you have growing fortunes in fewer and fewer hands. On the other hand, you have over here, you have banks saying, well, we think there should be fewer actors in the market because that will dampen down how the market works. And they try and bring capitalists together um, into one, um, into, into fewer hands. Um, and so this helped lead to the growth of corporations. Uh, so, and this of course made those cor these new corporations these conglomerations of wealth even more profitable. They would put more money back into the banks. The banks became even more powerful. It would lead to, and you, so you have a cycle of growing accumulation of wealth, of growing concentration of power. This naturally occurs, naturally occurs as a result of the normal functioning of capitalism from two different sites, from two different ways, from, you know, from, from banks and from crises. capital moves to wherever the most profit is. So if some new avenue of profitability is opened up and, and money that's invested there makes even more profit, suddenly lots of profit will move in, you know, lots of capital will move into that area, which tends to drive down the rate of profit. Um, because the anarchy of, of production, um, and I'm using anarchy here in a different sense than the political one, um, because of the chaos, you know, the capitalists don't get together and say, you know what, we should only invest this much in a certain area. Every capitalist wants to be the one who gets that profit. And so every capitalist tries to invest, and not all of them can survive it, um, drives down prof profitability. And like I said, the banks don't like the profitability of profit driven down. So they, the banks themselves start taking over this role. But more and more it becomes harder and harder uh, for the banks themselves to do this, and they start relying on the instruments of state and they start using the state to create institutions in which to try and uh, keep things from getting too crazy. So what is the state? Well, according to Lenin, the state is a special organization of force. It's an organization of violence for the suppression of some class. The state is the army, it is the police, it's the courts, it's the prosecutors, the judges, the prisons, it's the bureaucracy, it's the people who make the regulations. It's everything that exists to help the society function normally, and part of that is to keep one class, or one or more classes under the control of another class. States are actually created by a class. Um, Engel says the state is by no means a power forced upon society from without. It is a product of society at a certain stage of development. It is the admission that this society has become engaged, or become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself, that it is split into irreconcilable antagonisms, which is powerless to dispel, but split into classes. Um, but in order that these antagonisms, these classes, these conflicting economic interests might not consume themselves in society in a fruitless struggle, it becomes necessary to have a power seemingly standing over society that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. And this power arisen out of society with placing itself above it and alienating itself more and more from it is the state. And these states are necessary for the ruling class because they need to have a special body of armed men because if we just had a general population of armed people, well, when the conflict between the classes would break out, they would lose. And the last thing that bosses want, you know, the last thing that slave owners want are armed slaves. They, you know, they, want, they don't want slaves in control. The last thing that kings and, and barons want are armed serfs. The last thing that capitalists want is a general population of armed workers. So they need some way of protecting themselves, both from the workers, but they also need to protect themselves from other foreign capitalists. Um, capitalists would be like, you know what? They've got a lot of stuff we could just go take. Because you know, one of the ways of accumulating wealth from the very beginning in capitalism is just going and taking somebody else's shit. We do it still today. In Iraq, for example. Yeah. But the state also exists to protect capitalists from their own stupidity, from their own stuff, from their own selves. Um, 
you know, for example, there were back halves, this is the 70s or early 80s, there were a couple of brothers called the Hunts. They tried to corner the market on silver. They tried to get all, you know, so they tried to get about 25% of all the silver. So they would have the ability uh, to uh, command any price they wanted for the silver that they wanted to sell. This created a whole problem for the entire system, and the state went after them, took them out. We saw it happen more recently in, uh, with the, we saw it happen in the SNL crisis. We saw it happen with uh, the various banks that over leveraged themselves. The state has to intervene to save the capitals from their own from their stupidity. Um, and so it's not, this is a, you know, the system as it is, exists, needs the state. I mean, it can't not have a state. If it didn't have a state, like I said before, it would start creating its own, you know, it would start building up private armies, it would start building up private courts and prisons. Um, they would, you know, have all of the role of the state except in name. Uh, and so the, you know, so it's not a corruption of, this, of capitalism that the capitalists, the corporations, and the state have gotten together. It's the very nature of the system. It is how the system has developed over time. It's a natural outgrowth from, you know, as, as, wealth, in, as wealth accumulates, as the need, they need to protect it, they need to have a force that can protect them. So what does that mean for us? You know, how do we deal with this? this is a, you know, can we just you know, try like they did back 100 years ago to slap the leashes back on the capitalists, back on their corporations? You know, can we just restrain the corporations? Like if we just take away their ability to buy bosses, to, to, to buy the government, you know, uh, government politicians, as if that would stop them, as if they hadn't been you know, in command even before Citizens United? Can we, you know, could we put the genie back in the bottle? Was the genie ever actually in a bottle, or did it just look that way? No, we can't. Uh, yeah. First of all, they'll fight it. They always do. Uh, over a hundred years ago, Mark Twain said once, uh, he said, "Get rich illegally if we can, legally if we must. But even if we try and put restraints on them, they're going to try and go around it." We see it all the time because they figure that you know it's good business. What's the worst that's going to happen if they get caught? They get fined, and they usually get fined for less than what they you know, less than the profit they made. Um, they'll still be able to figure out. There's still a a, a, biz, a government to business pipeline. So if you don't can't buy the, the your government official outright, well he's going to retire someday. He's going to need a job. Who's going to want a job with you know somebody who can pay him a lot of money or somebody who can't? So they still have the you know, they still have the government that way. Uh, they still have it through their power over society with their money. You know, they can uh, when France in 1980 elected the socialists, who were running on a very radical platform, they said we're going to really re we're going to restrain the capitalists. The capitalists said, all right, uh, you try that, and we're just going to move all our business out of the country. Um, they said we will make the economy scream. They made the economy scream in Chile and the state stepped in, overthrew their government on the behalf of the capitalists, on the behalf of the corporations. And we can't simply put a leash on them. We can't restrain them. What we need to do is build a mass movement. We need to, you know, we need to get, cut the system off at the source. Um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of One Struggle. One Struggle wants to build a mass anti-capitalist movement. Um, what that movement then does um, would be the, in the response, hands of uh, revolutionaries trying to build a movement to actually overthrow the system. Uh, and I think 